Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, we hope that you are having a great day, and we're really glad to see you here at this um, virtual session as part of our ABLE annual meeting 2020. Um, I'm really thrilled that Eddie Watson is able to be here today. Um, Eddie wears multiple hats, including being the vice chair, vice president of ABLE, as well as the executive um, editor of the International Journal of ePortfolio. He also, of course, is at AACNU, and I will completely mess up your title, Eddie. I know you are the CIO and then a whole bunch of other wonderful stuff, um, but I'll just let you turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself. And if you, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tracy Pennylight, and I'm the president of ABLE, and um, we're really thrilled to have you all here. Welcome, Eddie. Thanks, Tracy. Um... And thanks everyone for attending. It's nice to see so many um, familiar faces uh, in the crowd. So I really, you know, since this isn't like 4,000 people, it's just what a dozen of us. So I do want this to be as much of a conversation as you would like for it to be. I have a handful of slides, but you know, as you have questions about either the International Journal of ePortfolio or what journals and editors typically look for, or you know your own research project love to have that conversation um, over the next hour and I know that we are stacked back to back to back with sessions um, at able so I'll definitely try to get us to conclude a you know a couple three minutes before the top of the hour um, so let me see if I can get my slide deck where everybody can see it I'm gonna share my screen So the question is, uh, Terry, what do you see right now on your screen? Do you see my slide deck? Okay, that's a thumbs up. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, before we get started with the session, I have a commercial, uh, if you will, for some things that are taking place next week. Um, Abel is doing a really cool thing next week. We're calling it the Shark Tank. Um, Helen Chen sent me this slide and she said that she was hoping that if I shared this, they would get a few bites. And if you know Helen, that is a classic Helen Chen joke. It was perfect um, for the Shark Tank. So if you are interested in learning more about this idea of the Shark Tank, it's where um, those that are participating in the virtual conference can pitch some ideas and get some feedback from those who've been doing e-portfolios for quite a while. You can certainly just go to this bit.ly address, um, bit.ly slash able20sharktank. We'll get you right to where you can learn more, you can sign up, things like that. And I'm sure Helen, she might could answer some questions about it as well. So um, if anyone has a question, I'll pause for a second and you can pose it and Helen or Tracy might be able to fill you in a little bit more. Well, and I'll just add to that uh, prizes. There's prizes, so that's a really good reason to submit a thing. Um, I, I'm if you're in the same space as me, you might be thinking, oh gosh, what would an innovative idea be in this moment? I don't know. I don't have head space to think about that. And if you're in that boat, that's okay. We're all about keep it simple. Just pose a question that you want to get some feedback on. The, the forum is really super simple and meant to be easy for you to engage and join. We really just want to have a fun conversation and get you some feedback on whatever ideas you have. So if you're, if you get, if you're worried about that innovation word, don't worry about it. Just keep it simple, do something fun, and uh, we'll be happily giving feedback. Okay. Thanks for that, Tracy. And more information again at this bit.ly address. So what are we gonna be doing over the next few um, minutes um, in this particular session? So I have kind of three guiding questions that I will be speaking to um, during our time together. Um, one is just sort of a broad question about you know, what skills do you need to do e-portfolio research well? Um, kind of a checklist of things for you to kind of think about. and as you think about submitting an article for publication, you know, how do journals engage with submitted articles? And of course, every journal has different processes, but I'm on a listserv with other journal editors, and it's interesting that we kind of all see things in, and typically through similar lenses. So I'm going to share some of those sort of inside baseball, since now baseball is now taking place. Um, 
I'll share some inside baseball notions regarding um, submissions to journals, and those may give you some insights into ways to maybe help your your manuscript or your submission kind of move forward. Um, so these two questions, I'm probably going to take 10 minutes to get through those two and more than happy to discuss as well. But then the heart of what I've got planned is really, you know, how do you get started and then where do you go from there when it comes to doing um, really any ed educational research project, but uh, it will be couched very much within the, this notion of e-portfolio research. So we're going to talk about research questions and methods and data and data analysis and conclusions if we make it that far. I'm also more than happy to share my slide deck with you. I didn't have this on my title slide, I just thought about this, but my email address is just my last name, Watson at aacu.org. So feel free to email me and say, hey, send me those slides and I'll be more than happy to um, send them to you this afternoon. So this is what I've got planned. Hopefully this somewhat matches your expectations um, for uh, the session whenever you saw it, uh, the title and described a bit. Okay, so what do you need to know to be able to do rigorous educational research. And I, I came up with a list of eight things, though there's probably more like 800 things when you get down to sort of to distill the various pieces. But the various things that you need to have a skill set to do would be one, to be able to mine the educational literature on your specific topic of, of interest. So be familiar with the databases that, that your library might have available to you. Also have some expertise at selecting a research design, like will it be qualitative or quantitative? And then once you sort of recognize what kind of data you hope to be analyzing or working with, then what kind of uh, approaches might you take um, beneath that? Um, you also will need some expertise in constructing or implementing measurement instruments, whether we're talking about rubrics or surveys or um, other tools that might be used to collect data um, from students that would be among the, the skill set that you would need to have. And then also being able to do the data analysis that would be required um, once you've collected that data. And I think for social science researchers, you know, Collaboration is very much um, seen or prized. You see, you, usually most articles in social science research journals are multi-author pieces. And I would say, as you look at this list, if you go, wow, well, you know, I think I know how to do stuff with the library. I think I'd have a sense of research designs, but really data analysis, you know, I'm not an SPSS person or I'm you know, just not a stat person. Well, that might be where you start to think about where you might look for a collaborator. Okay, so who in the School of Ed or in my assessment office, or maybe if your Center for Teaching and Learning has a scholarship, uh, a social mission, a scholarship of teaching and learning um, mission, maybe there's someone there that you could collaborate that would have um, the requisite uh, stat skill set. But think about how you might bring in collaborators based upon what your strengths and weaknesses are. So those four things, the first four bullets really kind of speak to the, the heart of what um, would be required to do research. But there are other things that are kind of like wrappers, um, if you will, um, for performing educational research. For So one would be uh, having a, a good um, a, applicable sense of the ethical issues around performing educational research and the IRB process, um, which isn't necessarily standardized from one campus to the next. There'll be nuances whether you're, you know, whether you're on one campus or another. So becoming familiar with your campus's IRB process. Um, there's a range of practical considerations. It's really just sort of like project management stuff that you um, might need to attend to uh, depending on the specific research design that you've selected. Um, depending on the journal that you're looking to apply to, you may need to adhere to APA style or whatever the other style that that particular, your, your discipline specific, if it's a discipline specific journal that you're applying, um, that you're submitting a manuscript to. Um, IG, the International Journal of Portfolio is an APA um, styled journal. So um, if you're from a discipline that doesn't typically traffic in APA, um, you would need to, uh, if you're thinking about applying to the International Journal of ePortfolio, you would need to have some competency around APA. Again, another reason maybe to search for a collaborator. 
Um, and that's really my last bullet here is just sort of think about the relationships that you have, either thinking about your strengths and weaknesses and who might you have um, that you could reach out to that could fill maybe a, a skill gap that you currently have, or um, maybe more fun is to think about who you would like to spend some time with and uh, work with them to build a project so that you can uh, you know, spend more time with people that you like, or these days, spend more time on Zoom with people that you like. Okay, so that's just kind of a laundry list of things that you kind of need to have in your toolbox to do ed research. Switching gears just a little bit here, I wanna talk a little bit about the International Journal of ePortfolio. And if you haven't checked it out before, it's an open access, full text journal um, that's available freely to anyone with an internet connection at theigeep.com. And the submission deadlines, there's two each year. There's one on June 1st and one on December 1st. However, manuscripts are accepted on a rolling basis. So if you didn't get the, the manuscript finished by December 1st, you could certainly submit it on December 20th and it would fall right into our typical review process. We just kind of have those two deadlines in place just to kind of allow us to draw a line in the sand and go, okay, this is the chunk of stuff that we're dealing with for this upcoming issue. Typically, if you submit something by June 1st, it um, very likely could be out by the fall. And if you submit something by December 1st, it could very likely be um, out in the April, May timeframe. So I think some of us have had the experience of submitting something to a journal and then it's accepted. And then 18 months later, it finally shows up for publication. Uh, we have a, a nice tighter um, process um, with the journal. Um, any questions? Um, just generally about the journal before I move on to our review processes? Eddie, I was gonna ask Helen this privately, but I guess I'll ask you in terms of the, the due dates. Um, this is Shemai Thacker, by the way. I work at UAA with Paul Wasco, which I'm sure all of you probably know. Um, and I'm working on an article with a faculty member right now with the intent to submit to IJEP. Um, so she has a she has a goal to submit in September, but your what I'm understanding is we we have technically until December right to really work on this because I'd like to give us more time um, if I can share that with her. But I, I guess I should I'm asking you what you would recommend. Yeah. So if you submit in September or in late November the earliest that because you're in that window the earliest for publication would be april so there there's no rush to to submit in september or october um i would say if you if you could if you could maybe have before the thanksgiving break as a deadline just that way it would get in the queue because we have a usually a rush on each of those two dates the june 1st and the december 1st but there's there's no advantage um, submitting like in September versus November from our publication timelines. Um, so if you, if, if it would behoove you to, you know, take a little bit more time, please, please do so because it won't, it won't slow down the publication likelihood or timeline. Okay, that that's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, glad to help. Um, okay, so what do journals kind of look at and you know some journals there's, there's either one of two ways that journals kind of handle submissions one is they get it and then they send it out to a reviewer or they get a manuscript and they do an initial review process that looks at a variety of things it seems like most journals have an initial review process um, which i really like because if you submit something to a journal and they determine that it doesn't fit the mission of the journal or their goals for the upcoming issue, you know, I would rather find that out, you know, within like a week rather than, you know, two months. So uh, the International Journal of the Portfolio, we do do an initial review um, that just kind of gets a sense of does this, does this particular manuscript have any chance of publication within the journal? And if the answer is yes, then we send it out to review. If there are sort of red flags, then we'll do the initial review. We typically do it in less than seven days. Typically, you'll hear back within 48 hours, actually. But um, things that we're looking for is like, number one, does it fit the mission of the journal? 
is it about e-portfolios in, in our case? Um, and sometimes we do get some, some things that are just not really related to e-portfolios at all. Um, you know, maybe there's literally a sentence that uses the word e-portfolio, but it's really about something else altogether. So we would then send it back to the author pretty much immediately and say, this really doesn't fit the mission. You could look at our mission. You could consider revising to possibly fit our mission, or here are three other journals that you might consider um, submitting your manuscript to. We always try to provide recommendations for other paths if we if we make such a, a quick pass based on mission. Um, other things we look at are just from our submission guidelines. Um, there have been a couple of times where, you know, our, 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 we, we were looking for manuscripts in the 15 to 25 page range, and there was flexibility there. I mean, if something came in at 14 pages or at 27 pages and it fit the mission, we wouldn't reject that outright. We would send it through the process and it could certainly be accepted as easily as a 20 page manuscript might. But there have been times, I think the longest manuscript was 98 pages. Um, it seemed like it was a dissertation with some pieces chopped off and they just sort of threw it over the fence to us, you know, and we were like, this is your, it fits the mission. It's just, it's a little, it's a little long. Could you bring it into the ballpark of the uh, length expectation? Um, and something else uh, that we look at are, you know, because we are an APA journal, we do typically, I mean, the thing that I'll do is I'll go to the, the references right off the bat. That's the first thing that I do, whether I'm reviewing for any journal or whenever I'm doing the initial review process, I'll look at the, um, I go straight to the references and it's like, are they attempting to use APA or is this clearly some other style? Is it MLA? Is it Chicago? Is it something that, you know, it's not even close? And if it looks like they're using a completely different style, then I'll go back and I'll look at tables and figures. And if those, if, if it's just that there was no attempt to adhere to APA, and of course, you know, it's every manuscript that's probably ever published. If you, you could go through there, you could find something wrong from an APA perspective. So we're not being nitpicky. It's just like, are you, are you trying to play baseball with a soccer ball kind of thing? I don't know if that's a good metaphor here, but that's, that's what we're looking for. It's like, are you, are you, is it in the ballpark generally APA? Is it close? Is it, are you attempting to do that? And if it is following APA and it is within the link, then it is about e-portfolios, then we'll send it out for um, review. Otherwise you would hear back and try to do it. We try to do initial reviews um, at least once a week, but you know, whenever I was flying, this is what I did in airports because I could just kind of look and you just look at style and then I would send things back. So often people would hear back within a day or two of their initial submission. Um, so that's kind of the initial review, what, what we're looking for. And then feedback that I've gotten from reviewers, um, like once you get beyond the initial review and now you're out in the, in the double blind peer review process of the journal, what are some things that that typically lead reviewers to reject a manuscript or to reject but encourage resubmission. And there's, there's kind of four different things that we that we often see. Um, one is the the focus of the literature review either not really setting the stage at all for the the manuscript and the research that comes or the focus of the literature review doesn't seem to have an acknowledgement to the journal that it's being submitted to. So for instance, if you know, submitting something to IG, if you, you wouldn't need four pages about what is an e-portfolio. You know, within the context of the journal, we kind of all, everyone that's reading the journal has a sense of it. Every, every article spends a little bit of time talking about e-portfolios. So, you know, maybe a paragraph, you know, you know, just sort of e-portfolios or this, 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 and then go on to the heart of the, the lit review. But sometimes we'll get these manuscripts that really almost the entirety of, of the lit review is just about what is an e-portfolio and it, you know, traffics through a whole bunch of the, the older literature, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about lit review um, as we move forward. Um, something else that's often 
commented on is, as you might imagine, is the quality of the research um, or some research design choices. I, I can remember one review this year where the, the manuscript had, the, the N was nine and the survey methodology that was selected, the, 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 the research methodology was a survey methodology. And so it kind of begs the question, if you've got nine people, why survey rather than a focus group or you know, just setting up one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations you know, around uh, the, the topic at hand? Like why choose that particular methodology where but it seems like there's probably a qualitative approach that might be better for such a small population. And then if you are doing a quant approach to have an N of nine isn't um, necessarily compelling. Not, not that it couldn't be publishable, but there, there would typically be some other attributes that would draw you to like, okay, so this makes sense why the N might be so small, but just various quality of research um, issues. Also, when you get to the end, often people will you sort of have like a good study Things are kind of marching along pretty well. You do the research and then there's like these broad generalizations, like because of what I found in my sociology class, everyone should be doing X, Y, and Z. And there, that's a huge leap from a small population to a much larger population. So the extrapolation and generalizations that are sometimes made in the discussion part of the manuscript are just misaligned with what the study actually shows. You know, so it's just it, the the, the lot there's a logical leap that there's a disconnect. So you know, sort of thinking about that, and really some of the things that I'm talking about here, when you talk about the literature review, or the quality of the research, or these generalizations, it's really kind of like there's a misalignment throughout the manuscript. That you know, one thing doesn't logically lead to the next. The literature review doesn't necessarily take you to the research questions or there aren't research questions articulated at all. There's the literature review kind of ends and then now there's a research methodology. So there's just these pieces that are kind of, kind of missing. So when I talk about this notion of manuscript alignment, it really points back to the, the research process that would have produced that particular manuscript. So the research process and this is, it is a process that kind of moves along this kind of a timeline. It's like you kind of have a sense of what your topic is, and then you, you research that topic. That's your literature review. And then that would lead you to your research questions. And then the research questions would then lead you logically to um, the kind of data that you would need. And then once you have your data, that would lead you logically based upon your research question to an appropriate methodology, an appropriate analysis. Um, and then the, what you find then should lead you to some specific um, recommendations or conclusions, something that might be practical in the real world. Like now that you found this, then what's the, the real application for people in, in the real world? And so this is where you often see the misalignment. Like there'll be something, um, the research questions don't necessarily flow from the literature review or the research study doesn't match the research questions. It's sort of like all of this alignment. And I, I often recommend people that they, that they just chart it out. It's like, if, you, if this is your research question, are you looking for that? How did you arrive at this research question? What was the literature gap that you found that led you to say, well, this is where I could, I could kind of jump in. But this is, this is a, a, a generalized sort of a uh, narrowed down um, summary of the research process and this notion of alignment that might be there. And these are typically the sections that you would see in an APA manuscript as well. So in, indeed, I think APA is fairly formulaic. You just, you just kind of have to put that blanket on that is the APA formula and you can kind of run forward with it. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these at a little bit more depth um, in a little bit of time that we've got left going forward, but any questions at this point, thinking about you know, my previous slide about what journals are looking for and how they sort of handle um, submissions and this notion of alignment. Okay, 
I saw Terry Rhodes kind of go, nope, no questions here. All right, so we're gonna begin by uh, talking a little bit more about identifying and developing your topic. So, you know, if you were thinking about making your own action plan right now, you might think about um, just generally kind of writing down, you know, what am I interested in? And what do I think I already know about this area of interest? So this isn't a research question. This would just be, you know, what is it that I'm interested in? Am I interested in e-portfolios and student learning or student success or equity or, you know, what generally might you find yourself um, interested in? And so an example might be, you know, your general area of interest might be students' reflective writing. How do we get students to write more? How do we get them to think more reflectively? That might just be your general ballpark area. And that should then lead you then to some specific areas in the literature that you might want to study, to learn more about. And you know, this is, I think, a really key piece is that notion of, the literature review leading to your research questions. Like I, I, I've seen this multiple times where people will look at um, sex differences, you know, student performance, male and female, and, you know, they've got a research question that speaks to it. Um, and so they do data analysis around it, but there's been no work in the literature review that would show that they've done any research in, in that domain. Not that they haven't, it's just not written up in the literature review. But if you've got a research question that's about differences in student performance between men and women, somewhere in your literature review, you should have spent some time looking at that reporting on what is already known about student performance writ large between men and women, or ideally more specifically within the ePortfolio domain. So in my example here, if we're interested in student writing and stuff, and you might get into the literature review and, and you discover that self-efficacy affects students' effort and persistence in completing a task, and you know, e-portfolio research indicates that no studies have um, been done to examine the effects of student writing self-efficacy on reflective writing. And that's kind of like sort of the, the dream outcome of a lit review where there's obviously this big gap right? You know, there's this space where um, no one has done work. Um, that rarely happens. Um, I think it's happened once in my career and not within the e-portfolio realm. Um, but what you all are likely to see are an example of students, of, of a research study that very much matches your interest, but maybe it's done in a completely different context. So if you were at a uh, an R1, and maybe you find a study that's kind of doing exactly the thing that you're interested in. And, you know, in this particular study, it's uh, got the same research questions that you're interested in. However, it was done, performed at a community college, and you're at an R1. Well, there's your opportunity for difference. You could write up, you know, this is exactly what I'm interested in, essentially. Um, but while the study has been performed, it might at best only be generalizable to a community college audience. Therefore, pursuing a similar line of inquiry, maybe even using very similar, if not the same instruments in a completely different context, then expands the generalizability of that particular line of, of inquiry. So, you know, don't, don't despair if you find someone else that's done studies just like the one that you would like to do. What's different about their context for their study and then maybe you drill down on that context in the literature, and then that gives you an opportunity to do something similar, but in a different context, and you can kind of continue on as you were hoping you'd be able to continue on to. But yeah, a big part of that is indeed finding the gap, which is what I'll speak to here as we, uh, a little bit more as we talk about crafting research questions. So I have sort of six steps um, for developing a research question. You know, one is that topic of interest, and then you get into the literature, um, and then hopefully you'll find that knowledge gap or that opportunity to extend an idea. And then this is where you develop your question to address that specific gap or this opportunity for extension. And indeed, from an, from an APA perspective, there is a, an expectation that your literature review logically builds up and leads to the statement of 
um, clear, measurable research questions. And that, that would end your literature review and take you into your next discussion of, of methods. Um, so you develop a question addressing the gap um, or the extension. Then you might think about refining the, the question for scope that's manageable for you within your context and within your, your set of resources. And then also ask yourself, is the question answerable? Like if you wanted to know, do ePortfolios have a positive impact on alumni income? But time has to pass to be able to measure that, you know. So if you wanted to know, like, if you, if you were thinking about alumni income, this is this is definitely a a amorphous question that I'm asking. But you, if you need ten years to see how that person progresses in their career to look at um, their income level, then maybe that that's not answerable for your particular context, or you know, maybe there's just not enough historical data that you could mine that would see students using e-portfolios a decade ago and how much they're making now. I mean, think about the scope of the question and whether or not it's something that you can, you can answer. So thinking about that example about student self-efficacy and student writing, you know, a couple of research questions that might come from that um, process. Actually, I'll go to my next slide, which I've got them repeated. So this is the example that I began with. So a couple of research questions that might result from the literature review include, do students with higher writing self-efficacy write longer reflections? So if you have a sort of a greater belief in your own writing, would you write longer reflections? And then maybe the next question is, if you've got this higher self-efficacy and maybe you're writing longer reflections, are these reflections deeper, richer? Um, those seem to be things that would be measurable with a with a rubric i guess right measuring uh length would just be word count so that's just kind of a mechanical quantitative process that you would do but certainly looking at a student writing sample and thinking about the attributes that would lead you to score a writing sample as having a deeper reflection that seems something that an instrument that could be created if it doesn't already exist and something that you could then, you know, design a study around. So any questions about sort of lit review or crafting research questions? Okay. All right, moving forward. So the next thing, if you've got these research questions, then a question is, well, what kind of data do I need that would lead me to be able to answer those research question, quest questions? So what data are necessary to answer the question? Could multiple forms of data be used to answer that research question? And then again, are the needed data attainable and maybe attainable with your specific set of resources? So again, thinking about you know, alumni and income, how would you pursue how much money at alumni are making a decade post-graduation? Would you have access to that data? Would that be another survey methodology? Would you, would you anticipate getting a high response rate when you're asking people about income? Lots of things like that that might make you go, maybe this isn't quite the right research question, or maybe I need to rethink it a little bit. Um, so thinking back to the example that we've been sort of mining, um, you know, thinking about students' reflective writing and how we get them to write more and think more reflectively, we've got those two research questions about longer reflections and deeper reflections. So it seems like, you know, self-efficacy scores, there's a number of self-efficacy instruments out there. Okay, so that would lead you to quantitative data. Reflections and their length, that would be more quantitative data and reflection depth via a rubric. You could basically translate qualitative information into numbers and perform quantitative analysis on it. So for these particular research questions, it seems like these are all things that um, are 
accomplishable. I just need a group of students that I could gain access to their writing samples. Um, so if you're thinking about a scholarship of teaching and learning project and you've got students in your own class, there's a real opportunity here then for this particular study. Um, so in this particular example, I've ended up with pretty much two quant sources and one qualitative source that would then be translated to quantitative sources via a, a rubric. But that's kind of what you're asking yourself is like, what kind of data do you need to answer your research question, quantitative or qualitative? And this kind of gets back to the skill set that I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, you know, often you'll come through grad school and you'll be in in one path or another where you'll take a lot of qualitative courses and you take a couple of quant method classes but you're really turning yourself into a, a qualitative researcher or it's vice versa you took that one qualitative class that was on the check sheet and you took a whole bunch of quant things and so you're pretty much a quantitative researcher could be that you're both that you're a mixed methods person but this might be an opportunity again to think about who you might collaborate with um, if you see that you do have a couple of different data sources or you're you're very comfortable doing things with SPSS, but you don't have a lot of expertise with rubric design and rubric development, then maybe that's where you seek out a collaborator is just around the things that you haven't had experience with. It's a real opportunity to learn, but you can also ensure that your your study is of as high quality as possible. So let's talk a little bit about then choosing the appropriate research method. And this is certainly a very short summary of a variety of different quantitative and qualitative uh, research um, methodologies that are out there. But I see these quite often in the publications that are submitted to IG. So lots of descriptive studies where you're just kind of reporting means and uh, just summaries of data sets, if you will. Um, there's often experimental and quasi-experimental um, studies. I should say that's often quasi-experimental where you can kind of do some random assignment, but you've got a group of students that weren't ra randomly assigned. In other words, you weren't able to pick from your population of students on your campus who would sign up for your class, but you've got a group. And now that you've got them, then you can do some um, experimental designs. But because they weren't randomly assigned, it would be classified as a quasi-experimental design. Um, there's survey methodologies that are quantitative rubrics, which translate data, um, qual data into quant data. And then qualitative studies would be things that reside largely or fully in the, the um, qualitative realm or the textual realm. So observations that you might be tracking and writing down, summarizing, uh, working with focus groups, looking at student journals, um, writing up case studies. So these are groupings of various um, methodologies, but I would say that we see largely submitted to the journal um, surveys and rubrics and focus groups. So if you go back and look through our publications, you see there are a lot within sort of that domain of research methodology. So I'm going to talk about each of those three um, briefly. So one is survey research. Um, probably the most popular one that we see. And I think we're all familiar with what surveys are, but um, citation from 15 years ago, a survey research textbook uh, took this quote, there is no better method of research than the sample survey process for determining with a known level of accuracy, details and personal information about large populations. And I've always thought that that notion of large populations um, was really key. You know, if you've, again, if you've got nine students in your class, maybe surveying the nine students isn't the best way to learn about them. Maybe there's some other methodologies that would be richer. Um, as you think about doing surveys for your, you know, of your students or as part of a research project, if you have any plans to present or publish your research, you should, you must get approval from your institution's IRB. If you're just doing a project to improve your course for the next semester and you have zero plans to share that data publicly, I mean, including not even at a departmental meeting, then you likely would not need to go through IRB. However, it's worth a phone call um, from one institution to a next. There are different nuances again, as I mentioned. So 
you're just trying to figure out how to do things better in your own class and it's just data for your own purposes, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't need IRB, but definitely just give them a call, tell them what you're doing and they'll either point you toward the web page and the form or they'll say, you're gonna be just fine as long as you promise not to share any of your findings publicly. Um, a note about survey research. Um, survey research contains self-reported data. So that is one of the limitations of uh, a survey. And so you should acknowledge that um, in the manuscript that you write up. Um, there are also some validity and reliability challenges, but there are some things that you can do to kind of help you along the way as you think about using a survey research methodology. So ETS has a fine test tool that has um, over 25,000, probably uh, more than that at this point, um, different tests. So you can, you can go to this ets.org website and search for the area that you're interested in, and it will show you um, what instruments have been created specifically to measure that particular construct. Um, if you don't, there's multiple places that you can kind of go to look for things. Um, so the ETS tool is one path to go through. Um, it's possible that an instrument exists in the literature that hasn't been indexed. So there are a number of different databases that you might look at. Um, the psych info uh, from APA is a really good one to kind of just go in and do your lit review looking specifically for instruments. Um, also, you can have some good luck just doing uh, Googling for web instruments. For instance, Frank Fajares has a great site on self-efficacy instruments at the University of Kentucky. In fact, many instruments translated from other languages are available on his website. So sometimes you have scholars that are, um, have, that are, that have collected things um, for you and, and um, sort of curated them for you. Did I hear a question in the background? I wasn't sure if I heard someone speaking, but maybe I should pause to see if there's a question. Okay. Um, so if you do find an instrument out there in the literature, so it's published in a journal, um, the sort of correct path forward would be to contact the author and request permission. In fact, for my dissertation, I found an instrument that I really wanted to use. Um, I found a translation. I emailed the professor who was in Spain. Um, the original instrument was in Spanish. Never heard back, but I was fortunate to have a, a good friend at Furman University who was the Spanish professor, and I sent him my email. He translated it, and then I sent it, and then I heard back. Um, in Spanish, um, giving me permission to use the, the instrument. So that's definitely the, the best process. Hopefully you won't have to go through a translator to do that, but um, it's, it's best to ask permission before using an instrument and then secure their permission in, in writing. Um, sometimes locating an author of an instrument can be difficult. So if it's published in a specific journal, you might reach out to the journal and ask the um, journal editor, do you have recent contact information for this particular author? Um, some professional organizations have directories where you can go and look up someone. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just ways to kind of try to go through the right due process to get permission to use previously published instruments. I think that that's definitely the preferred path rather than trying to create your own instrument and then thinking through and performing all of the tasks associated with um, validity and reliability. Typically, if an instrument has shown up in the literature somewhere in their um, literature review or within their own method section, they have performed some analyses say around reliability or described the steps that they took to create that instrument that would then establish some validity for that instrument. So it's great if you can find an instrument that's already been created for you out there or is, is really close to what you were hoping to do and that you wouldn't have to change things too much. Though there is logically, if you start 
revising an instrument, you may need to, even if there is reliability performed and reported in previous studies, you'd need to do some of those analyses as well. So I'm kind of going down a, a hole now for you, but just highlighting that if you can find a pre-existing instrument that measures what you hope to measure, um, saves you a lot of legwork, especially if they've done their due diligence before it made it to that article. Okay, so that's survey research. Let's talk a little bit about rubrics. And rubrics are used for a lot of different purposes. You hear that word around assessment and around research studies and for grading purposes. But a rubric will enable you to kind of standardize the evaluation of complex course products, such as writing assignments or larger e-portfolios or um, student presentations, things like that. Um, to sort of you know somewhat standardize the evaluation process of those instruments. So some key challenges around rubrics are the rubric creation process and then of course there's the human element those that are actually using the instrument for measurement. So it's not just the rubric kind of chugging away on its own. There's a person who's using that rubric who uh, come up with scores. So once student work is scored, it takes textual student work or a performance and turns it into numbers that can then, uh, you can use statist traditional statistical tests for data analysis. So that's kind of how you would use rubrics. And there's a number of big storehouses of rubrics out there. Probably the most um, famous was put together by Terry Rhodes, who's on this call, uh, the value rubrics. So. Um, you know, as you think about scoring student work and if there are specific learning outcomes that you're looking at, the value rubrics might be a good first stop, um, though the literature as well, depending on what you're looking to measure, what your research questions are, might lead you to other rubrics as well. And so finally, I'll talk about focus groups a little bit. So focus groups are a qualitative research method. Um, they're usually, somewhat free-flowing discussions among a small homogeneous group of maybe seven to 12 participants, but there is a facilitator who has a script of sorts, but can typically um, digress from the script based upon the direction of the conversation of the participants in the room. So it is expected that there would be some divergence, but they do return to the script so that sort of the the spine or the core of that particular conversation um, isn't lost. Um, if you're doing focus groups and you have the resources such as a, you know, a student or a close collaborator that you're working with, it's really helpful if you're facilitating a focus group to have someone else that's engaged in the note-taking process or you have recording equipment in the room to capture the discussion. That way you can kind of focus on facilitating rather than facilitating and note-taking. Indeed, the act of listening and note-taking is an is a, is a act of multitasking that's, that's difficult to do. Um, so jumping back to that original example that we were um, looking at. So we've got those research questions about self-efficacy. Um, looks like we probably have a couple of different methodologies that we would use. Some would be a, a, a descriptive, would be descriptive work and some would involve some survey work. There's probably several different ways that you could actually nuance this and go at this in different, different ways, but that appears to be where we're, we're headed. So I don't have much more to share really regarding analysis because it really gets um, so deep depending on the data set that you've got. So this might be a perfect point looking at the clock too that we've got about eight minutes till the top of the hour in the next session. But this is a good place for me to, to um, pause and stop and see what questions you have. Maybe you've got your own study that you're working on or maybe there's something that I went over pretty quickly. I, I hear myself talking quickly in my AirPods today. So more than happy to revisit something. Or my, my typical joke at this point is, have I spoken with unbelievable clarity today? Is that, is that what I've done?
Hi, Eddie. This is Andrew Longhoffer at Pacific University. Um, with the theme of last week's uh, part of the meeting, I was wondering if you could go in a little bit on your thoughts about the ethical considerations when working with portfolio work in particular um, and the, the kinds of content that students are willing to share uh, in a portfolio that they may not necessarily have intended to share with a larger publication audience um, and where kind of informed consent comes into that uh, and what the what the boundaries are uh, that, that you encourage people to observe. Well, I think that transparency is always best and with, with students to let them know what you're doing with their data, how and often you know, students might as soon as they hear what you're using my for what, but if you often share you couple that discussion of transparency, what you're doing with the data to share how it actually will help future students or how it benefits faculty as they try to structure e-portfolios in the future. When, when students often hear that, they're often a little bit more receptive. Um, also, your IRB office will often help guide you through those ethical considerations. So sometimes you might, you know, it, it's difficult to think about, you know, everything soup to nuts A to Z. And like, are, are you, are you sure that you've got your hands around every aspect of you know, research design and ethical considerations? But that's why the IRB office um, exists, is that they will ask questions of you. Um, they, you may find them to be somewhat annoying at times, but that's a really good thing that they are uh, an active IRB office that's um, posing questions and recognizing where there may be limitations. But you know, I think that as much as you can without changing students' um, approaches to their work. Like I know sometimes if you, in studies, if you tell participants exactly, in some cases, like what, what you're hoping to study, then sometimes they will make selections to either, um, it creates biases in the study in that they're trying to either specifically give you exactly what you're looking for and answer in a way that they're expecting that you want, or they are specifically trying to avoid giving you exactly what you want. So that's one of the reasons why you would work with your IRB office to say, okay, this is why there's this little piece I don't want to disclose, um, but I want to be transparent in all of these other ways. And they'll help you negotiate through that. Um, you know, I think every example that you might bring up, there's always sort of like these nuances that um, one should one should uh, consider. But I think thinking about the larger discussion of transparency and uh, striving for transparency is the best way to approach um, any research with students. Eddie, there's also a question in the chat about the researcher that you referred to at the University of Kentucky. Oh, Frank Paharis. So P-A-R-E-J-E-S, I think. Um, he was at Emory and uh, this fantastic self-efficacy site. I mean, dozens and dozens of instruments and studies. And then one day it just vanished. My heart sank and then I found that he moved institutions and he took his website with him. So yeah, uh, University of Kentucky, that's where Frank is these days. Uh, late career uh, researcher. He's edited and written books on self-efficacy. He's sort of like a second generation um, Albert Bandura. I haven't been following the chat, so definitely if there are other questions that are there, feel free to just sort of verbally share with our small group. Well, there was an earlier question about the Perl database, and um, we have put the link into the chat, but I didn't know if you wanted to say a few words about the benefits of that particular database and the ePortfolio research. Yeah, happy to do so. Yeah, the web address is there and it's easy to remember, just eportfolio.aacu.org. And so this uh, was a website started by um, Jessica Chittam primarily with a couple of colleagues. And what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a searchable database of articles that have been written about ePortfolio 
and that's all that you're going to find there. Um, in other words, you know, like when you go to um, EBSCO and you search and sometimes you just search and search and you just find stuff from every corner of the world and then there's that ePortfolio article. What they've, they've already done that work for you and so the database, um, you can assume that anything that it brings back, everything it brings back is going to be about ePortfolios. But you could search for like self-efficacy nursing and so it's going to be about any articles that have been written about nursing and and self-efficacy and e-portfolios. So it's just, it just makes it so easy to get to um, the citations that you're looking for. I mean, to do a perform a lit review, it's just the, it's just the perfect tool for an e-portfolio researcher. So um, definitely check, check that out. It's open access, it's free access. If an article is available freely, there's a link to the article. Um, there'll be links or citations minimally to everything that's in there. But if it's something that's, you know, behind a paywall, like, you know, an, something that's located in an EBSCO database, then you, you would need to go to your library and, you know, search, find it through that avenue. But there's citations for everything. And if there are open links, like for everything that the International Journal of the ePortfolio has, there's open links. So if you search, you find that article on nursing ePortfolios um, and self-efficacy, you just click the IG link and it'll take you right to it. I mean, so you literally, from the instant that you type in a search, you often can be in an article within 15 seconds that's relevant to what you're interested in. So uh, check it out tweet it to your friends. It's really a useful tool. Well, Tracy, I see that we're like 90 seconds from the next session. So I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Eddie, for that. I think it's really helpful to have that information about doing research on ePortfolio. Um, you know, I think sometimes when we're trained in our particular disciplines, making that shift to educational research can sometimes be a little bit of a mind bend. So um, it's, it's great to have um, the steps kind of fleshed out and to hear about how the journal looks at articles and reviews them and, and gives people feedback. So yeah, thank you so much. I hope everyone found this session useful. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye for now.